Um, so I started out doing this kind of thing 20 years ago, because this year, I'm, yeah, it's, I'm celebrating 20 years working in tech, and um, started out doing systems administration, kind of what we used to call, you know, ops, tech ops, database ops, NOC, uh, leadership as well as individual uh, contributor. Um, started out at um, a local ISP, as many of us did, and then moved into uh, working for LiveJournal, where I ran that network. Memcache was developed there, so kind of got involved in the social media scene and scaling these websites on no money. So I uh, eventually worked at Twitter, where my job was to kill the fail whale. So uh, hopefully succeeded there, because most people now don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and then took a year off to travel and ended up back at Fastly, where I thought, why not just do it all over again? Uh, where, where Fastly is growing um, at a crazy uh, pace. It's a what we used to call a CDN, but we are now referring to as an edge cloud platform, um, where we're basically enabling the uh, faster delivery of real-time data and websites over a distributed sort of cache network in uh, 36 data centers over five continents. Our current capacity is about 10 terabits per second, though we're quickly increasing that infrastructure right now. So never a dull moment um, in that whole world. So I'm gonna talk to you today about how we handle incidents, the things that we put into place based on our experience and some of the things that matter the most to us. Um, some, we'll be talking a little bit about some tools, a little bit about some stories, and then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, before I get into that, I'm gonna talk to you about something that happened to me over the winter. I was on a plane to Cincinnati, and I woke up to an image like this. And someone telling me, Lisa, wake up, the cabin's full of smoke. And, um, you know, I've been on call a lot, and so I think I'm like pretty capable of like waking up and immediately going into like fix logical mode, you know? So I'm like, okay, my shoes are on. I know where the exit is. Now I'm just waiting, like my brain's just going through all this. And um, I was like, well, what an awesome time to think about incident response, like in the wild. So um, I was kind of noting, you know, what are, what's happening right now? The people who are responsible for flying the plane and for serving me drinks are suddenly also responsible for my life, for landing the plane, and also like keeping everybody calm. And so as I was, um, you know, with my head down in the emergency crash position, uh, which I realize is really to get us all to be very calm and not like look at each other and freak out, um, I'm thinking about like all the things that are in play because we land and we speed to the, you know, to the gate. It means all the other planes were redirected. We got like the first, you know, go straight ahead and a fire engine greeted us there. Um, and this is all happening like probably two or three minutes after I woke up. It was extremely fast. Um, so not only were the people that um, I had in my own flight, this sort of decentralized group of incident responders, they were also kicking off other incident response, you know, processes uh, with air control and on the ground um, so that I got out not only alive, but feeling like really good about Delta and like my experience there. So like now I'm like, oh, I love Delta because I didn't die that time. It has nothing to do with whether or not like they didn't like save my life, right? Like it was like the air conditioner was smoking, like we were fine. But I didn't know that at the time, right? And, um, and, uh, and I don't know, it was really, it was awesome. So in my day-to-day -day job, um, I'm not responsible for people's individual lives, which I'm really excited about. But um, the platform that we provide for, uh, provides this sort of infrastructure uh, of critical data and information that is used in global emergencies and big events like the election. We host the New York Times. Um, we have uh, weathered many DDoSs against uh, uh, critical information delivery networks. We have Twitter as a customer. We've got you know, the New York Times, The Guardian. We've got a lot of these big, you know, if you're online most days, you're hitting Fastly. So while that's not someone's individual life, it's uh, our network being available constantly, or at least you knowing what's going on with our network um, can, be, can make a big difference in your life. 
Um, so these are the types of things that we do see. And they're the same things that you see. Um, there's nothing different because this is like the internet. This stuff happens every day, constantly, and we're not gonna fix that. So that's like when we start talking about like how can we have an incident response process that is sane and makes sense, the first step is acknowledging that it's gonna fail. Um, and you're, things fail, you'll fail, people you work with, your software, your data center, your network provider, these things are all gonna break at some point, and that has never ceased to be true in 20 years. Um, how you respond to them, though, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's your fault or it's someone else's fault. What matters is how it's impacting the customer or how it's impacting the reader at home. They don't care whether or not it's a, a bug of yours or a capacity problem or the data set are caught on fire and flooded, which I've also been through. By the way, if anyone wants to share stories afterwards, I've probably been through every bad thing that can possibly happen. Or I'm about to because I said that. Um, so, the internet fails. You still have to do your job. You're a person. You don't get to hire a group of people that are just sitting in the back of a plane waiting for something to happen. Uh, so they can suddenly be your incident responders. You yourself and the engineers and the, and the support engineers and the sales engineers, you're the people uh, that need to switch from that running the business to uh, responding and ensuring that customers um, know what's happening. So uh, when I came in to Fastly, I think uh, the sort of idea of like calling something an incident, this is really common, is um, to get people's attention like an executive maybe is like, something's broken and I don't know what it is and I'm scared and I don't know how to get people on so I'm gonna call it an incident. I'm gonna say that this is really urgent. Um, that's super common. So what I like to do is talk about what's the impact of it, right? Like, yes, it feels really important to you. How is this actually impacting the customer? Yes, it's not our fault. How is this impacting the customer? And from there, we can sort of develop this framework we started with, we know things will fail. Then we go, well, okay, but if this one network trans transit provider in a region that's got 12 fails is something. If in South Africa, the transit provider fails and there's really only like a couple transit providers down there, that's a really big deal. Now we have traffic going to London that should be going to Johannesburg or coming from and going to Johannesburg. So um, that's where we then focused on what's the severity. And that's something that's like, old school ITIL, it's been around forever in ops, but I kept it, because I'm like, okay, we're all getting rid of our knocks. We're all getting rid of our, there's no ops anymore. There's no servers, there's no ops, but stuff's still breaking and you still have to respond to it and someone still has to fix it. So I kept the severity levels as a way to like keep the sort of standard uh, vocabulary for executives, management, and engineers to all use. Um, and then from there, we have our expectations about, okay, how are we gonna respond? How are we gonna follow up? And uh, what else do we do? How do we communicate with the customers? So uh, just in specific detail, this is what our, um, this is a version of our severities. We keep them pretty simple, zero through three. You hope zero's never, ever, ever gonna happen. Threes actually happen pretty often. And, um, we track our severity three incidents as well as we track anything that's uh, more critical. And the reason we do that is to keep us in practice. The sub threes that seem like, ah, oh, it didn't impact that many people. Oh, it was just this one region. Those are your practice. Those are your drills. Those are your, um, maybe the light is out on the plane and that doesn't seem like a big deal. But that one customer sitting there, look, I don't know, I used to be really scared of flying. And if I saw anything broken on a plane, I was like, holy crap, if that's broken, the whole thing could be broken. We're not gonna land. Not being super savvy with uh, planes. Um, so even if it's only impacting a few people, that's your experience to, um, to make sure your process works. So we still do a review and a post-mortem and go through the five whys review how we should be improving our monitoring, how, how we, of course, how we can prevent it from happening next time. Of course, you're always doing that because you're an engineer. But all the other things, could we have found it sooner? Could we have told our customers about it sooner? Um, those all get reviewed weekly no matter what. Uh, it doesn't have to be the most important event. 
the higher the severities, or I guess the lower in number, the bigger the impact. Um, the, you know, we may spend more time, we might have a bigger group of people involved in the postmortem, but everything's going through at least some review. So when we start this, it looks like there's a lot of incidents. And when we rolled this out, it was scary because it was like we were telling the executives, we were telling everyone in the company, we're having a bunch of things happen that impact customers. However, over time, we saw the more SEV3 events that we tracked, the fewer SEV2s and SEV1s that we experienced. So what's at the core of this whole process and how you should be thinking about incident management uh, in your place? It's that we are people, we have human needs. If we treat everything that happens on the internet as if it's this major event, then a couple things happen. One, nothing really seems like it's a big event anymore. And two, um, your engineers don't get sleep. Like, imagine if we asked the pilot to deal with everything that ever happened in the back of the plane and then also made sure that he landed the plane safely and took off as well. Um, and then you can eat and sleep on your, you know, whenever you figure it out, like whenever you fix whatever is happening in the back of the plane. That's not how businesses work. That's not how you're going to have like a good customer experience. And you're going to um, you're going to be randomizing them, and they're not going to be thinking about like how can we actually be smarter about how we do these things. So at the core of um, our our mission and how we make this 24 by 7 network happen, it's understanding that we're staffed by people, and um, when thinking about a framework or how you would handle incident response better, think about how do I get the right person at the right time without broadcast mode. Um, another thing about Fastly, we don't have a traditional knock. Again, most, of, m most businesses are kind of moving away from that now. Uh, so how do you have no knock and the pilot um, knows what's happening in the back of the plane so that he can make decisions in the front, he or she. Uh, you empower everybody in the company to have the ability to escalate, to know what's going on at any given point. So our process for incident management is super transparent. Everybody, anybody in the company can escalate through the incident management process. Anyone in the company can watch real time uh, us troubleshoot and mitigate incidents in our Slack channels. We have a global team of customer service folks. We also have a global team of SREs. So there's no point in us having a group of people waiting to just escalate an issue when we can have it go directly to somebody who actually knows how to fix it. And um, I should mention, we also have de decentralized. Every engineering group, every service at Fastly has an engineering group that's on call, a development engineering group on call in addition to SREs and NetEng. That's hard to accomplish, I know, in many places, and we can definitely talk. I, one day I'll do a talk about how to accomplish that. I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but I do get a lot of questions. Um, one of the ways we've allowed this to work, though, is apart from partnership, um, we've given them control of their own destiny. Here's a monitoring platform. I think we probably have seven different types of monitoring platforms at Fastly. Choose the one that you wanna use, understand what are the metrics that make your service um, healthy and how it impacts customers, and then you're gonna be involved at the postmortem, so you're gonna to come to the incident review meetings. And when we're going through the timelines, and we go, what happened during those 15 minutes it took to escalate? And the answer is, we didn't have it monitored. That's part of the conversation that we encourage the developers to um, improve their monitoring. Now, this is done in a blameless way, but I think having the developers and the SREs and the NetEng all in the same room when we're reviewing this is how we, um, encourage that sort of feedback and coordination and cooperation. So we've always been empowering them to improve. And I should mention as well that our, um, the main critical point that makes this all work is a position we have called the incident commander, which is a shared position that's an on-call rotation with directors, VPs, managers across sales engineering, computer, or computer, what year are we in? customer support, um, uh, development. These are folks who like volunteer on top of their day job to be the one critical person coordinating in the middle of an incident. So we, you know, generally the process is something's found to impact customers. This could be from 
uh, Twitter. It could be from our own internal alerting. It can be from uh, ign you know, noticing something on the internet. Um, we had the S3 outage, uh, the internet experienced the S3 outage in October last year. And um, that was this example of an incident that literally, like, Fastly had nothing to do with it, and it wasn't actually breaking any of our infrastructure. But obviously, it had major impact to our customers' customers, and a lot of the origin requests were failing going to S3, so we noticed it. Um, so we actually had, uh, we noticed it ourselves from our internal network monitoring. We noticed it from reports from customer tickets. We noticed it in the errors we saw for, for our customers' origins. And um, we actually updated our status 40 minutes before Amazon did. Um, letting our customers know that they were down. Um, and that's because all of those different people on each of those different levels were empowered to be part of this process. Um, so this coordinator, what do they do? They generally know how Fastly works from a technical perspective. They know where our on-call schedules are and how all the services sort of work amongst each other. Um, they're kind of like, okay, what's the, their impact focus? What's the impact have we told customers? Um, and then we have a procedure that's like related to communicating with customers that gets kicked off from the commander. They don't have to do it themselves, they have to kick it off. The next thing they're doing is calling in the experts through the on-call and, and doing positive acknowledgement. Are you the person who knows how to fix this? No, who would the next person be? And that's, that's actually how we were able to save a lot of time doing the whole thing where everyone's like, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So the other thing we do is t time box. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to figure out what this is. And if you don't have it, if, if you still don't know in 10 minutes, we're escalating to the next point, the next uh, movement. And we've been able to shave a lot of time off of our response that way. Um, our incident commander is allowed to call off any other deploys. So we do, there's like tooling we have that will break, that will lock our deployment system. No deploys, no changes, period, until this uh, incident is over. And that's, as you know, in a in a large, flat, flattish development organization, sometimes it's hard for developers to know or for other people working in the network, there's changes going on right now. Maybe don't make the situation any worse or different, uh, only better. And then here's really something that's super critical. I, we know that this issue is no longer impacting production. We've communicated to customers. We're moving the dialogue about all the engineering things that people love to talk about into another forum. This incident's over. You can stand down if you need to go to sleep, if you need to eat food, if you need to spend time with your family. Go do those things because the rest of the stuff is cleanup. And then the incident commander is also responsible for making sure the cleanup like happens as well. Um, so that's that's our that's our main thing, the IC. Um, and it sounds really fun when you're the commander, you're commanding. Um, so I talked about this sort of transparent approach that we have. And um, I, I, I get told quite a bit from our product, marketing, HR, legal teams that the, what they like. And to me, it's like, of course you're involved. That's like a bunch of stuff I don't want to deal with. But from their perspective, they're thinking, I never got to be this involved before in like how we write our Fastly service advisory and um, what is our decision-making criteria. So we involve those parts of the organization at the executive level and the incident commander engages with other executives to get their input on our service advisories. So you're not just seeing a root cause from an engineering group. You're seeing the perspective, you're bringing in the perspective of things that you maybe hadn't thought about before. And I think that's, um, that's a great way, if you're an engineer who's responsible for the uptime of a service, for you to engage the rest of the company in a way where it's not all on you to make sure that we're communicating and remediating and mitigating um, appropriately. Um, so we call this like crowdsourcing. We do crowdsourcing of, of our FSA, and it goes through a lot of re reviews before we send it out to customers. We go through the five whys when we're letting customers know, like, what would I want to know? Like, I'm, like, if I were working at another company, I'd be my customer, right? So I'm always looking at it like, I would want to know more. I, what does that mean? Um, when in doubt, we choose transparency, and I think that's actually expected in the industry as well, and I think uh, it makes me very happy. Um, the challenge with the wide collaboration, and maybe some of you are thinking this, 
you don't actually want everybody's opinion, like often. Um, so there's a challenge here, which is this natural tension between like, should I go ask people their opinion? Because the problem with that is I'm gonna have to listen to their opinion and respond in a way that's not being a jerk. Because if you're a jerk about someone's involvement, they're not gonna come forward and help later when you need them. So part of the training and, and the work that we do as incident commanders is understand uh, first that people, volunteers, folks that wanna give you their opinion are coming from a good place. They care about the customer. Maybe they have information that you don't have. But in a delicate way, you've got to be able to sort of take those, that desire and redirect them. So, for example, in also I think in October of last year, which was a horrible month, um, there was a DNS outage with Dyne. And uh, that was like front page CNN news once it was back online. And, you know, it was like a really big deal. So, of course, everyone in the company, like 300 people in the company, they all want to be involved somehow. Um, because not only was it, it was impacting some of our internal services, again, it was impacting a lot of our customers. So I was the incident commander that day, and you know, I've got like 50 people from all over the company going like, I wanna help, what about this? Did you see this? They're saying this. And, you know, you've got like the security side and all the rumors about where the attack's coming from, and then you've got the like, what is the vendor actually saying about what's wrong, interesting. And then you've got the like, how do we actually help and like mitigate the pain for us? And how do we mitigate the pain for our customers? So um, we established a core team that focused on mitigating um, the impact to Fastly's infrastructure. And then I just set up several other groups and was, and was like, okay, you, you're figuring out how we'd launch our own DNS service for customers right now if we had to. Like if this person never came back up again, how do we do that? That's you, that's your group. Here's the lead, go figure it out, come back in an hour, let's have a check-in check time. You're working on documentation that we're gonna be giving to our customers. You're working on, you know, and so basically we were able to get all these sort of parallel um, steps in motion in case we weren't able to come back up in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and they all felt sort of happy, engaged. And what it meant is, luckily everything did come back, but if it didn't, I wouldn't have been working with an already tired group of core engineers to also go tackle the next thing. So that's a, I think that's a great way to use volunteers. Uh, you know, give them a task, give them a follow-up time, and then ignore them until you're ready to talk with them again. <clears throat> um, so we talked about the um, sort of the importance of going through the whole cycle every time as your drills with the sub threes um, and, and how basically this process itself is gonna help you improve your overall operations. So um, we do track everything in JIRA um, and we do an incident report that's pretty typical post-mortem that's timeline focused for every incident. We meet, like I said, weekly to review them all as well as additional meetings if it's a larger incident. And um, we go through a postmortem process. I don't, I don't know what this, sorry, I lost my momentum on this slide. It's very important, everything, everything we do here. Um, I think the biggest point that I brought into Fastly was that I was watching postmortems, and then at the end I'd hear, oh, but we got through that and we did a good job, right? Like that's part of the challenge of the blameless postmortem oh, but it's over and we got through it and good job. Instead of, okay, it's over, but when this, when this happens again, what are we gonna do about it? No blame, but let's work on what we're gonna do to help prevent it uh, or resolve it faster next time. So that's, that's why we make ourselves do this weekly mitigation. So here's the actual response process in slide detail. I think I've reviewed all of it. Um, Oh, the incident report, I, one note about that, the incident responder is like the person who's on call and actually hands on keyboard. Um, we have the incident responders sort of share the load of the timeline. So the incident commander creates the timeline as soon as the incident's over, and then we essentially work together on a timeline where again, it's like on a wiki and everyone can contribute with their own graphs and details, and that's expected to happen within 24 hours after an incident. 
Um, another note on the exercises we do for continuous improvement. Once a quarter, we get together, I'm sorry, once every six months, we get together and do a tabletop exercise, which is like the world's funnest D&D &D game, where we're all, you know, you have this role, you have that role, and we walk through what would happen if such and such situation. And we choose a situation that hasn't happened to us yet, because as I said before, every incident is essentially a drill. So this is like a drill on top of that, where it's even more scary. Um, and this kind of helps us feel like we identify gaps. We, we do the same post-mortem for that that we'd do if it was an actual real incident. So in conclusion, start with your basics. Everything fails. The internet's really crappy. There's weather all the time. That's not going to go away. Empower your engineers. So don't just give them the responsibility. Empower them. Make them part of the process. Help them feel like what they're doing is actually helping. And check in and make sure you know when they're not, when they're being martyrs or unhealthy about their contributions. Be clear about on-call schedules. If you don't have an on-call schedule, if you have engineers that say they won't be on call, they're implicitly agreeing to be on call 24 hours a day. Because you know that time that their software breaks and, uh, or your software breaks and you can't be reached, you're going to like feel kind of crappy about it and someone's probably going to get in trouble you know, somewhere in the organization. So uh, make it clear when you expect someone to be available and not. I think that's the, the fairest way to treat engineers. Um, always partner. Realize that there's other teams that can teach you about incidents from a perspective that you don't have. And then let this process continue to teach you. That is it. Okay, so you mentioned that you use Slack. Yeah. Would you go into some detail about how that works for you? Uh, well, it's real-time chat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, it works unless it doesn't. So actually we separate, there's particular chat rooms that are based on the whether or not something's an incident with a capital I or if it's just a regular production um, event. And again, we refer back to the severity. So uh, I don't have a slide in this presentation, but we do have, just like there's that SEV matrix that I showed, we have a corresponding matrix for communication protocols. So for each SEV, it says which chat room to go into. Um, and so our major, major, major incident channel, a lot of folks do Slack notifications if something happens in there as, because they're insane and they just want to hear everything happening all the time. Um, I have it on when I'm on call, but I don't have it on other times. Um, so the expectation is if you're on call, you're in a few specific IC chat rooms. And then the other thing is if you just want to be, um, sorry, so if we update the status of our on status page, that goes into a general announcements area so everyone in the company can see when there's something that's impacting customers. Um, if Slack is down, there we go to secondary channels. So in the past, we used IRC, so we've got some of that capability. Um, and then there's also Google Hangouts because uh, we're already there anyway. There's always improvements I have a totally there. Okay. We'll come back. I'll share. It's okay. Um, first, thank you um, for the talk um, about the incident commanders. That how do you select them? You said oh yeah, who's on top of their day job. So is it voluntary? Is there a selection process? Do you say no to anyone? And then typically, like maybe who or where in your organization. Really good question. Yeah, really good question. When I started, it was only, they had only let a couple of the engineering VPs who were, happened to be the people that were the only people who knew how to run everything at the company. So in order to become an incident commander, when I started, it was you have to know how to literally fix varnish if it's crashing. Um, so that's not scalable. Um, so this system, in switching it, we. Uh, first of all, we do look toward management, uh, which we, our managers are engineers as well, so are fairly technical. Um, so I'd say people are not volunteering if they are way on the completely non-technical side, which you know, 
so I don't have to turn them down. Um, I did have to turn, I did suggest to someone that maybe it wasn't a great time um, because their day job was so far removed from deployments and customer interactions and stuff like that, that the hurdle would have been too high. Though technically, if you're really in a coordination role and you really stick to the script, um, you shouldn't have to know all of that, but we do a lot of, we still have a lot of that gut feeling that's like, hmm, that deploy went out at 4 p.m., you know, like that, that kind of stuff. So we do typically want to have um, managers uh, because of their experience level and also because their sense of accountability you have to be really engaged during that period of time. Um, there might be two SEV3 incidents in a week. Um, and so the other thing about it is if you are way too overstretched, it's not a good position for you either because you're not going to be available. Like that's your entire focus once there's an incident. Uh, we do incident commander training, so we have a lot of documentation about this. We're developing checklists now. Um, we've just hired a, a director to lead this whole program because it's been successful like as her full-time job. So she's going to be doing, uh, so there's documentation of the framework. There's um, video training and in-person training for the commander. And then the flip side is we have to train all of the incident responders, so the engineers, because otherwise they don't know how to interact with the commander. So we do incident responder training for all developers and NetEng and SRE before they go on call. Um, and then we have to redo it like every three months because we are all children that forget things every three months. So we just, you know, we have the links on our wiki and people can watch them in their own time. Did I hit all your points, or was there still one more? Um, no, that was pretty good. I guess the, well, you hit that one. Uh, what about scheduling, and what is your typical time frame? Uh, you know, right now, it's a week long, like seven days, 24 hours a day, primary and secondary. But I think we're going to switch to a three-day rotation because it's too exhausting if, for example, there's an election or something like that where you're getting hit from all sides, um, as we were during that horrible week. Uh, any other questions? There's a couple. Um, what do you mean by SRE? What's the what's that role in your organization? That's everything from uh, that's everything from depending on the experience and the focus and the specialty of the engineer we hire. That's everything from more operational, fixing things on the front line, triage and automating that work, to response and remediation of alerts themselves, and then working uh, closely with the developers. Um, so there's sort of like, if you think about it in terms of like a, like a timeline, there's like SREs embedded with the application groups that are working on how we do deployments and automating deploys and configuration management and sort of ensuring that they're working side by side with the developer to understand how to deploy in our infrastructure. And then we have SREs that are more on the front line. So the idea being we're catching things as they're coming in and also helping to prevent them from happening in the first place. So it's like a nice little cycle. Uh, follow up to that, how do you balance like moving the needle forward in terms of improving mm -hmm. the organization versus the uh, incidents that basically work as an interrupt and basically randomize people? Yeah, that's a great question. This process has been able to feed into understanding where to fill gaps in hiring and in um, tooling. Uh, so when I started, oh, I didn't mention, sorry, we categorize all the incidents as well. So if it's operati operational, it's like, a, like when I started, a many, a large percentage, like a third percentage of our incidents had human error, misconfiguration, something like that, somewhere in it. I just like searched through all of the logs of the last three years before I started. And um, that led me to know that I needed to put direct uh, people working on the automation of a lot of our processes. So we focused on that. And then the, we've gone through a period where we have more software bugs, and then we know we need to focus more on our testing. and. Um, and sort of how we deploy uh, and find errors before we deploy them. Um, so we, we, we kind of let this process guide us in, um, 
in where we focus next. The other thing I should mention is not everybody is on call all at the same time. So uh, this process is really to be very specific. Like the week you're on call, yes, you're going to be that person that's interrupt driven, but the next 10 weeks, you're not. So that's kind of how we're, we're doing it. Okay, so about the incident responder, is that a SME, somebody who's like, once you figure out what the incident is, they know how to fix it, or, okay. I don't know what SME means. Uh, subject matter expert. Oh, thanks, yes. Um, it's, it's, so it starts as the person who's on call, like the first person who's responding in that as the subject matter expert. Um, if they don't know how to fix it and they need to escalate, then the next person is the responder. Okay. Yeah. They're just the on-call people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. the type that people type in. There's another one in the back. Hi, do you ever invite your, ch uh, your customers into things like the Slack chat room or stuff when uh, things start getting out of hand? We haven't, but um, I'll let you know that this, com this talk I'm giving right now, I've given it about five times in the last year. Always a little different, of course, specialized for you. Um, but uh, three of the times we've had an incident occur, which is so weird. I know that makes it sound like we have incidents all the time, but we could have been going for like weeks with no incident. And I get up here, like I haven't checked right now, but I'm, I'm assuming that if we had an incident, your pagers might go off. But like, um, we've been tempted to bring up like there, that happened recently where someone showed the channel as they were doing the data restore. I forgot which company it was. We've been tempted to show that. Um, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm ready to yet. But uh, I think that would be interesting. Definitely. Would you show it to your customers? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe if they were muted. Uh, but actually, we do have Slack channels with our customers that the CSEs are in uh, directly. And then we have the IC channel where we're, and then so the CSE is sort of in this role where they're relaying information. So I do hear what customers are saying in the middle of an incident because I'm getting that through the Slack channel. Do you also, um does that also apply to the postmortems? Do you do you allow um, customers to take part in the postmortem with you? No, we uh, we have not done an open postmortem. We deliver the our service advisory, which you know usually has a timeline and our final root cause in it. But we've never had them um, actively engage. We do get a lot of feedback, and we respond with that in that feedback, but. Is that something people are doing now? Is this, do chef, I not know this? The chef is doing. The really? The chef does open postmortems, and, and it's really been extremely beneficial for the company because we get the perspective from people that totally things we weren't thinking about at all and how it impacted customers that we can then take back in internally too. So. Yeah, that's great. Any other? Oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you talked about that you started doing uh, tabletops for incidents. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like, what you do in it, lessons learned, and mm -hmm. how you've gotten better? Yeah, so um, first of all, I should mention security is the other component of, uh, we consider business impact as well as infrastructure impact with our response. So if there's a security event, our security team has their own incident response and we work together with them. So the security team is actually the one currently leading tabletop. So that's cool because they're, they're very focused on risk, business risk. Um, and so one of them will come up with a scenario, and this was super sneaky, but the one they did a couple weeks ago was directly in response to a meeting where I said we weren't doing something yet. And then they used that in our exercise. So they were like, oh, imagine this scenario. And I was like, damn it. So um, they'll pick something that they know we have a weakness in, and they'll do this, this very detailed narrative. And I'm not kidding when I say like role playing, like he's the DM and he's like, okay, here's the scenario. And then, at, and then we designate, you're the on-call SRE, you're the on-call NetEng, you're the on-call, and then like literally walk through, okay, what do you do next? Okay, well, I'm gonna ask you as the SME, um, do you know the answer to this? Actually, I don't. Okay, and then literally they'll go and they'll look through documentation until, like, as, as if, so it's not just, 
And in that case, like answering an interview, I would go and look in the wiki and magically find all the information. We actually um, do it. Um, and so we did like a, a data restore recently and I was dismayed at how long it took us to figure out some things um, that uh, realistically would have taken that long in, in real time. Um, but we just walked through it. And then we write everything just like a postmortem and file JIRA tickets for all of the things that we found that were gaps that need to be um, resolved. So we're really, uh, we really are at the top of the hour now. Um, Lisa, are you uh, going to be hanging out? I'll be here for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Questions. And feel free to hit me up to email or Twitter. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to, to get to your question. I know we're going to try to keep this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is it, do you have time? Is it a quick question? Yeah, let, let's just let's do it real okay. quick. Okay. So you mentioned that you do um, notification to someone and then acknowledge, are you the right person to fix it? And mm -hmm. then they have a time box period and then it goes to the next. Do you have a tool that you use that's from some of these DevOps tools that are here and other? You know what, Remind, Remind on Slack. Uh, Remind in 10 minutes. Are okay. you the one that knows how to fix this? Oh. Or, cause you, you know, you're like helping. So you're like, what do you need? You know, what do you need to get to that answer? Uh, I need to run this in my test environment. Okay, how long do you think that will be? 10 minutes, okay, we'll check back in 10 minutes. And then you set the Slack reminder, and then 10 minutes later, you're back. Um, it's so important to do that. The number of times we see incidents where someone's like asked a question and then it just scrolls by. Yeah. Um, so we do like simple, simple, simple. So Slack reminders, you don't need a DevOps tool. Okay, with that, everybody, let's give one more uh, round of applause for Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So we're finishing up with this.